Welcome to our little conversation about fundraising to close out our uh, series of lectures on the creation of the City Summer Festival Orchestra, the Performer's Field Guide to Music Festival Foundation. One really important thing to remember when we talk about fundraising is that there's no like cookie cutter way or no special magical method of fundraising that works for everybody and is infallible. It's going to be different for every organization and every community and every project, essentially. So I'm going to talk about what things I have done and things that work for TFO. Um, and we might brainstorm a little bit about things that can work for other organizations and other contexts as we go along. Just bear in mind that I haven't unlocked some magical formula about this. I haven't even, yeah, I have. Okay, great. I'm going to set myself up for a screen share. Okay, so fundraising. I think when, when we start talking about fundraising and thinking about fundraising, it's important to establish a philosophy similar to the way we establish a philosophy when we're talking about mission statements. It's very similar. Um, I know for me, this was a big deal as well, like getting started in like academic fundraising, so learning about fundraising in a school context. Um, because when I started learning about fundraising, it was like a year after I started TFO, and I had a very like, what was me outlook on fundraising, like, you gotta give us money or we're gonna die kind of outlook. And that, you know, was really not the right way to look at it. Um, of course, you wanna display some kind of need, but there is a difference between begging and helping people find their way in fundraising. So this is the first thing on the slide is a quote that I really love. Um, from one of our textbooks that we had to read and it's giving is a privilege and we are the stewards of philanthropy. This was huge for me because that went from me saying, thinking in my mind like, oh my God, we have to fundraise or we'll die to, oh, people do want to give and they need guidance. Like people have got things to offer, they have money to give, they want to support good organizations and great projects. They just need some guidance. And as fundraisers, we're going to guide them into exactly the right kind of um, philanthropy for the donor. So um, it's important to us and it's up to us as fundraisers to help uh, donors contribute to organizations in the best way they can. It might not always be cash. It might be with food or in our case at TFO, it's venues and spaces for rehearsals. Uh, host families are a huge form of donations for TFO and the meals. Um, there are tons of ways to, um, to get contributions that aren't, don't necessarily come in the form of checks or cash. Um, and you always have to say thank you. It's a mate and you have, again, like everything else that we've talked about in marketing um, and community engagement, it's all about relationships, right? Um, there's a reason we call fundraising development. Um, so if you're out there looking for arts admin jobs, you might see jobs called like development director or development associate, something to do with development. And development is about fundraising because all these things go hand in hand. Fundraising is another way to develop your community. That's a good way to think of it. Um, it gets people engaged and it gives people a sense of ownership to the organization. Giving is good. Asking for donations is good. At TFO, um, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization and this is kind of the standard for arts organizations around the country. So we're all musicians here um, and we classical musicians. So chances are we have dealt with 100% nonprofit arts organizations. Um, like any symphony in town or chamber music society, you're probably working for nonprofits. Um, one exception will be like touring bands and stuff. Like I know uh, Eric Castle has played with almost every like major touring band that comes through Kansas City, whether it's Evanescence, Lindsey Lindsay Sterling or otherwise, and that would be a for-profit for situation. Um, so 
our biggest source of fundraising comes from in-kind donations. In-kind means things, basically. Uh, things that are donated, whether tangible or otherwise, that aren't money. Um, so of course, housing is a big one because we put all the musicians up with host families. Um, and food, we get uh, at least 16 meals for all, all 80 musicians donated each year. So eight lunches and eight dinners. Um, and all of our venues, we do not pay for any rehearsal or performance spaces. Those are all donated in kind. And the math adds up to, I think like $300,000. I might have the actual number later in this presentation. Sorry that I don't remember it off the top of my head. I need to work on that. Um, as far as actual money is concerned, any money we raise goes into operations, musicians, and marketing, basically. So operations in the in terms of arts organizations generally refers to like salaries for employees or like staff um, or basic things like keeping the lights on. It's kind of a general term, but in our case, it means making sure we have a staff and the resources that we need to make this happen. Um, we, I think we do put about a quarter of our budget into marketing, um, our, of our monetary budget into marketing, um, but then three quarters of it goes back into the musician's pockets. Um, yeah, publicity, programming, and supplies. Okay, so here is kind of the like breakdown of our funding and our our budgeting in the most simple of terms. So our in-kind donation value is about $250,000. So that's basically what it would cost for us to put all of our musicians up in hotels and to give them stipends to feed themselves every day. That's about how much it would cost just to, to give the musicians what they need to come out even at the end of the festival. Um, after our in-kind donations, our actual budget is about $20,000. We do include the in-kind donation value in things like grant applications and stuff like that because it helps us kind of offset um, the value of the grant a little bit, which we'll come to in a bit. Um, most of our donations or our money comes from individual donations. We do a lot of letter mailings throughout the year. I think we do like four different mailings throughout the year. Um, like Christmas cards or holiday cards, and we do a Valentine's Day thing. Also, we do Valentine's Day things because we have a spring fundraiser, and so that's a good way to get people to save the date for the spring fundraiser by sending out a Valentine. Um, we get a little bit of money from grants. Uh, my mom, Patty, is our primary grant writer, and she's very good at it. I have, I have written a few grants, and my success rate is about 50%, but hers is like 90 She's got a weird gift for grant writing, which is awesome. Um, and then we do get a few like corporate or business sponsorships, but those are pretty small. Um, we used to get a big like $1,500 corporate sponsorship, um, but they're, that was from the Parks and Rec Department. Their budget was slashed and they quit sponsoring us. Um, but in total, our sponsor, corporate sponsorships come to about $2,000. Um, this isn't totally, like as far as the size of our budget and the proportions of where all this money comes from is pretty standard actually. You'll find that in most arts organizations, the bulk of their um, fundraising will come from individual donations. A little bit will come from grants and then a little bit will also come from corporations. Um, I've seen, I've worked for one arts organization here in Kansas City where like 90% of their money came from grants. It was really fascinating to observe. They just had like a killer grant writer on their board. Um, but I thought that was a unique situation. And then I think it also depends on what kind of arts organization you're working for. Like I think operas uh, depend a lot more on ticket sales than any other organization. I know that when people are studying arts organizations, they have to leave out things like the Metropolitan Opera from their studies or they'll totally throw the whole thing out because it's unique and it's so much bigger than any other organization in terms of operations and budget and everything. It just throws everything off filter. Um, so yeah, as I said before, all of our actual money is allocated towards musician stipends, staff salaries, music rentals, and then marketing programs, reference, swag, advertising, all that's included in marketing. We get a little bit of return on swag, 
um, the merchandise, but we consider that an expense generally because we, it's not a good source of fundraising. And I think that's pretty normal as well. That merchandising is generally not considered fundraising, marketing. Okay. And while I said there's no magic formula to fundraising, this is as close as I've gotten. And this has to do with the ask. The ask is what we call that moment, whether written in a letter or spoken in person when you're actually asking for the, the donation. You're asking for a specific amount of money from a specific person or entity. Um, and this is kind of how I approached letter writing specifically. Um, I kind of think of it this way too, if I'm talking to someone in person, I'll take this a similar approach, but this is absolutely the formula I use when writing a proposal for either a grant or for an individual donation. So of course, we start with some kind of opening salutation. To me, it's really important that you greet each patron personally. And I know that can get overwhelming if you have a big mailing list, but you wanna establish some kind of common value or something personal right from the get go. Uh, and right after you open this letter, you want to get straight to business. You want to ask, and you want to ask for something specific. You don't want to like, this is something I have been taught and consequently proven to be true. This was one of those things I learned in fundraising class at FSU that I then applied to my fundraising strategy at CFO. And it was very true that if you just ask for people to make a donation, it's not likely to happen, but if you ask them to give you a specific amount of money, chances are it'll happen. And you always want to aim high <clears throat> for your ask because chances are they'll hear you, recognize that you need something, and say, Well, I can't do that, but I can do this. Like they will they'll negotiate with you. But if you ask too low, they'll be like, Great, yeah, whatever. And you may have had potential to get something more from that person. Of course, it's a delicate situation, person or entity. Of course, it's a delicate situation where you want to judge the situation before going in. Like, you want to have a good enough understanding of this person or entity that you know what they can do. You know what kind of donations they're capable of. Um, but if you're unsure, I would say my advice is to always aim on the higher side of things. So you want to ask for a specific amount or item of support for your project. Um, so I know we always send out a letter to people who have hosted musicians at Piano Photo Reader asking them to be host families yet again. That is a very specific ask for a specific thing that we need at PFO. Um, we always describe our project in great detail, but also a very concise amount. Um, so basically you want to explain to them what you're doing and what your desired outcomes are. Um, and how the desired outcomes like contribute to their values and how you share those values. And don't forget giving is a privilege, so don't feel sorry. <laughs> don't feel sorry, don't get into the woe is me uh, mindset. It's not good for anybody. Um, I think it gives donors a lot of anxiety and they start to get nervous that they're putting money into a lost cause as soon as you go down that route. Um, so, after you have accomplished your ask and described your project and the potential outcomes, <coughs> you want to explain to your patron or donor how you're going to approach the goals together with these grants. And so sorry, there is construction happening outside. It's very stressful for the doggo. Um, so for example, how are we going to accomplish our goals together? So when I'm writing a letter to host families asking them to host again, I'll say thanks to all of our host families. Our musicians have a very comfortable place to stay and have a very friendly visit to France since they're in town. And you will be able to make a relationship with this musician that can last a lifetime. Um, you also want to give them a sense of ownership for the project. I talked earlier, earlier a little bit about how when when people make donations and are guided towards their like best donation possible, they can take a really great sense of ownership of the project or organization. And that's what you want. You want people to care deeply enough about it that, that like it belongs to them and that they will want to contribute year after year. Um, another really simple thing in writing bullet points and lists can be really effective. If you can make a bullet pointed list of things you will accomplish together or 
Um, if you can show them how their donation will positively impact their community, um, that will really resonate with a lot of people and encourage them to give. And then as we get to the closing part of our letter or our proposal, um, we want to ask again, kind of as our conclusion. It's like a, the old five paragraph essay, right? Very similar. We asked and then we, we said hi, we asked, we talked about what we're going to accomplish. We're going to ask it one more time and we're going to close. Um, so in, in your ask again, at the end of your letter, you want to make sure you give clear instructions for giving. Um, and if you're giving, if you're sending out like a letter in the mail, you definitely want to include like a stamped address envelope. So that all they have to do is plop that bad boy in, a, um, in their envelope and drop it in their mailbox. Make it easy for them to give. Um, or provide on your website, on the home page, like a big old link that says donate here. I have, um, I've definitely gotten some really negative feedback from donors at TFO in the past when, like when we've gone through a transition of um, overhauling the website where they're like, I can't find out where to donate. And it makes them really frustrated. And then they, they don't necessarily want to contribute <laughs> as much as maybe they might. I don't know if that's true for us, um, but it could happen. It could happen that way where if they just like can't figure it out, they'll just abandon the idea altogether, especially if they're trying to do it online. Um, and then you want to close the letter to kind of wrap it up um, to, you know, thank your donor for being a part of your organization or a part of your project um, and encourage them to participate in the future of the project, whether it is to continue buying tickets or whatever. I always say, see you at the concerts. <laughs> and that seems to be appropriate. So that's my basic formula for um, proposal or letter writing, especially if you end up with a grant that's like, just to, if, they, if you are trying to apply for a grant that just says just submit a proposal, like there's no application involved, this is the kind of thing you wouldn't want to write. But it would be more of like an essay. Ugh. All right, and this is a nice list of further reading. So there are tons of things you can read about fundraising. I think everyone's got a great idea about, you know, or they think they have great ideas about fundraising. Um, but these are my favorites, absolutely. Um, so the Temple, Siler, and Aldrich Achieving Excellence in Fundraising, that's where that <laughs> lovely uh, philanthropy quote came from. Um, we are the stewards of philanthropy and giving is a privilege. Um, those are, that's a series of essays on fundraising by a lot of different authors. It's a big book, but it's definitely my favorite thing, my, my favorite fundraising book. Um, for proposal writing, my favorite book is The Minor and Minor, and I think they come out with a new edition every few years or so. So if you're interested in proposal writing and getting that kind of book, I would check on the most recent edition. Um, my teacher at FSU called these kind of books cookbooks. Um, and it really is kind of like a, a cookbook of grant writing. Um, they have a lot of um, information about grant writing resources and databases and where to find grants, and a lot of formulas Kind of like mine. Mine was probably um, an adaptation of theirs after reading it for a grant writing course I took in school. Um, and if I, you can see I have the Turabian manual for writers. That seems kind of goofy, I guess. But if you if you're writing like this, I think it's really important that you <laughs> are writing things that are grammatically correct and have the right punctuation and they're easy to read. And you, for that, you definitely will need a style manual. Um, I recommend the Turabian because as a music academic, musical academic, this is what we use, this is the standard. So if you don't have a manual for writing, this is the one to get. Um, I love Matthew Hensley's book, Creativity to Community. Uh, it came out right before my book did and it was the kind of thing that like kept me up at night for a couple of nights because I thought we had maybe written the same book. But I got a copy of it, and his is a little bit more general. Mine is specifically devoted to music festivals, and his is about like entrepreneurial music and organizations as and arts organizations as a whole. So I really recommend that book. It's awesome. He's a guitarist based in Austin, Texas. And then we have Doug Borowick's Building Communities, Not Audiences, which I mentioned yesterday, is a great philosophy on um, audience building in general. 
Um, and um, I love it. It's really inspirational. Then we have the Wallace Foundation. They have tons of resources. They have lots of books and things. And theirs are all free. All you have to do is go to their website and request them. And they'll just mail them to you. And they'll give you lots of like case studies to look at. Um, lots of research. It's great. Um, and my favorite, one of my favorite textbooks for arts admin is uh, William Burns's Management in the Arts. Again, this is another one that comes out with a new edition every few years or so. Great information on proposal writing. Tons of um, templates. That's one of my favorite things about that book is it's full of templates and examples. Um, and it is very like introduction to arts management uh, textbook -y. And then of course my book. It'll kind of go over everything I'm talking about here and my perspective and things we have learned at TFO over the years. Um, so ultimately our goal of fundraising is to continue developing our community and building our TFO family. We want to eventually be able to reach all of the Ozarks and beyond. And that's kind of the benefit of doing this virtual series this year is that we're really expanding our reach um, because everything is online. Um, and of course, we hope to keep our concerts free and open to the public, which is why we do fundraising, right? Um, and we hope to continue to provide an enriching experience for our musicians and for audiences, quite frankly. We want everyone to have a good time because if, if only one half is benefiting from the orchestra concerts, then it's no good. It's no fun for anyone. Now you know. This is one of my favorite moments from movies of all time, the young Frankenstein, young Frankenstein, excuse me. So that's it. That's my general philosophy on fundraising. Um, but something else, I guess I could talk about like some other little things. Like I know uh, crowdsourcing or crowdfunding is really popular um, right now and I am not super crazy about it. Like we have done fundraisers on Facebook and stuff and not seen the checks before, or like they've gotten lost or they don't, they'll show up like eight months later or something. Uh, crowdfunding can be really sketchy. Um, and also I feel like every organization has like maybe two crowdfunders in them for like the life of their organization. So TFO did a crowdfunder um, on what did we use? Indiegogo uh, to basically pay for our 501c3 application, which was $850. And we raised that money. And then we did one other crowdfunder and it fell short just a little bit. But I think it made, it was pretty clear that that was it. Like that was all we were going to be able to accomplish. So if you're starting a new thing and you want to get into crowdfunding and crowdsourcing, really plan for it. Like make sure this is this is the time when you need it. This is when you want to do it. <laughs> this is it because you've got at most two crowdfunders um, that are going to be successful. That's my most humble opinion. Do you guys have any questions about fundraising in general? I don't. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Um, now you know all my secrets, I guess, or my not so private secrets, my public secrets. Um, but if there are no questions, I think we can close this meeting for now. Um, if you guys decide you do have questions, like please feel free to reach out to me. Otherwise, I'm going to go take a nap because I have a tour of migraine developing. <laughs> all right, guys, I'm going to end this recording.